Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and Jerry's here, and this is Stuff You Should Know. Oh, about- and look, there's Andy Warhol. Yeah. And Edie Sedgwick, and, and Lou Reed. Yeah, and Jackie Curtis, and Valerie Solanas. The whole, the whole gang's here. We, we did one on that, right? And the Scum Manifesto? Yes, we did. Okay, Chapter 18 of our book is on the Scum oh. Manifesto and Valerie Solanas shooting Andy Warhol. We did not do it as a podcast yet. No. Oh, well, well, we maybe probably we never will. will. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, Chuck, before we, we uh, get into this, we should dispense something because I, I think it's very instructive about Andy Warhol. He is what probably the most famous quote from him is that every in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. And yeah. he didn't say that. Yeah. Even in an interview in 1980 he said he didn't say it. He used it in um I think a 1980 or 68 exhibition um like the notes mm-hmm. but it wasn't his. There is a uh, there is at least four other people who can make a claim to having said it first. And that that says a lot about Andy Warhol that he, yeah. he he was not shy or embarrassed or even secretive about taking other people's ideas, even asking for other people for ideas to use in his own work. And then it also shows that um, that the idea that he said that and that that's so associated with him and his whole you know ethos, mm-hmm. it, it also demonstrates that he himself was one of his own works of art. Yeah, his own brand, his own image his own totally. appearance, everything about him he was his, he was a, one of his own works of art and those yeah. two things are all captured in just that one little quote yeah that's a good way to put it uh a little bit about his childhood before we get to the the good stuff mm-hmm. uh he was born actually andrew warhola uh he would drop the a years later he was born and it's interesting you think of warhol as a contemporary artist which he is in some ways but he was born in 1928 mm-hmm uh, it's not like, you know, he was a bit older when he was uh, at Studio 54 in the 1970s. Older as in, like, my age. <laughs> Even stranger than that, Chuck, he was born in Pittsburgh. Yeah, well, not stranger if you're from Pittsburgh. He's he's a, Pittsburgh is very proud of their Warhol connection, uh, mm-hmm. especially to Carnegie Mellon University where he went. Uh, his parents were European immigrants, and his mother was an artist. He was the youngest of three boys and his parents were very encouraging of his art. Yeah. Uh, they got him a camera when he was a little kid. Uh, they sent him to art classes and eventually would pay for him to go. It was uh, Carnegie Institute of Technology at the time, but uh, Carnegie Mellon now, which is a great art school. Just kind of. Period. Right. Yeah, it really is. Um, I read that the whole family um, just kind of, I don't want to say coddled, but he was a bit of the center of attention. He was the center of the family being the baby of three boys. Um, and when he was a kid, he uh, came down with um, Sydenham Korea, uh, or Korea, which is also known as St. Vitus Dance, which is a really mean name for a neurological disorder yeah. where you um, have involuntary movements. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was in bed for a number of months. And he, again, just happened to have a, a mom who was into art who took that time to teach him to draw. Yeah. And then he also spent some of that time reading celebrity magazines. So those two things that he got into in the um, when he was sick in bed really kind of came together to form the foundation of his whole career. Yeah. Um, and like you said, he was the youngest. He was also ill. Uh, he had a skin discoloration issue. Uh, he didn't like his nose. He thought his nose was bulbous and misshapen. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was bullied at school. He was always very um, – just always felt bad as sort of about the way he looked. And then later in life when he would wear wigs and have plastic surgery and wear makeup and stuff like that, people would say that sort of, you know, was Andy from the time he was young. Um, His father would die when he was just 14 years old of jaundice liver. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was very hard on young Andrew. Uh, He could not go to the funeral. I don't know if that's from emotion. Yeah, yeah. He he was was just completely overwhelmed, yeah. Okay, yeah. So he was hiding under his bed during the wake. Uh, and eventually he would move to New York City in 1949, where he would drop that A and become a very successful commercial illustrator, kind of pretty quickly. Yeah, he knew how to hustle, too. I read that he would go to record stores and, and look at um, album art and then pick out the labels that had the coolest art and then go mm-hmm. to those labels and, and try to get work from them. Yeah. And it, it worked a lot. And 
I think it's one of those things where once you make a name for yourself with a couple companies, it gets easier and easier to get work. So he made a pretty a pretty good name for himself. He made a pretty good living as a commercial artist for at least the first decade or so of his career. Um, and he had this this style that I don't know was unique to him, but you know he basically adopted it himself where he would draw something, um, usually kind of out of proportion. Some parts were more detailed than others. It very, very early 60s drawing, like almost Pink Panther type yeah. illustration. And then he would blot the ink before it was dry. So some parts would be thicker, some lines would be thicker than other parts that were not even disconnected and almost appeared dotted. And then he would go over and color them in outside of the lines, like almost blot them with with paint. Um, and he became really well known for that. And it was uh, really good to apply to women's shoes. And that was one of his favorite things to draw commercial art for. Yeah, he also started, and this would come uh, come in very handy, as we will see when he sort of had his assembly line art thing going at the factory. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would he made stamps of things. He made rubber stamps, and this is how he would do printmaking. So if he had a client and was like, I love this, but I don't like the color, he could go do it again without starting all over just by changing the color out on the stamp. Uh, or if he was doing like screen printing or printmaking or something like that, mm-hmm. he's very easy to change things up. Um, he then, like you said, he he won awards. He made some pretty good money. Um, he was out as a gay man uh, in the 1950s. I've uh, even seen in, both. I've seen that he was and that he wasn't. Oh, really? I've always seen that he was. But either way, it was the art world of the 1950s. Even even in that scene, it wasn't the most normal thing to like be out and proud. Right. For sure. No, definitely. Um, so. One of the things that made Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol, is he never really saw um, the high art that he created, gallery art versus commercial art, as something more elevated than Mm -hmm. the commercial artwork he did. It was just different, or maybe he could make more money for it, or there were other people involved. But he viewed the gallery owners, the curators, and um, people who would eventually commission him um, or, you know, buy his work, he would let them help shape it. Like, he wasn't like... One of those, you know, the picture of the artists who like can't right. even take the uh, f- the first note about yeah. their work. You get he what would you be get. like, yeah, exactly. Like you were his client when he, you were buying art from him, and that's how he viewed it. Um, and that was that was definitely new, and he carried that throughout his career, and it had uh, a lot of benefits for him. And then toward the end, it really kind of detracted from his his image, as we'll see. Yeah, for sure. Um, early on, he and this is in the fifties. Uh, you got to remember, he was selling. Uh, some self-published art books. Uh, He had one called Studies for a Boy book uh, that was in a gallery called the Bodley Gallery, and it was his first solo exhibition. Uh, They were sketches of young men. He was not shy about um, projecting sexuality in any of his works. And uh, like we said, this is the 1950s. Even in the art world, some people accepted that stuff. Other galleries were like, no, we can't have like gay-themed art in our gallery, uh, even in like a New York art gallery. So he was kind of pushing the envelope early on with that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. He worked with his mom. His mom lived with him. She moved to New York and lived with him for about 20 years yeah. until she left in, I think, 1971 mm-hmm. uh, is where she, she went home to die, right? Yeah, essentially. And um, w- w- another, just like with his father, he ignored letters from his cousin telling him like his mom was dying. Mm-hmm. And apparently she was holding out for him to visit and he never did. And I don't think he went to her funeral either. Um, and he said later that, uh, in a quote, that he he couldn't bear to think of it. it he he likened her to a bird that had died recently mm-hmm. and that he couldn't even bear to think of the bird dying, that he just liked to think that it was out for a walk. Yeah. So that kind of thing just totally overwhelmed him. He was very close to his mother. I mean, think about it. He lived with his mother for 20 years Yeah. during, like, the height of his, his career and fame. Oh, yeah. And supposedly also they were both deeply religious Byzantine Catholics, and he would— um, carry a rosary around in his pocket with him. But there's a lot of legends and stories about Andy Warhol. There's also another story that he would carry loose diamonds around in his pocket because he liked to just kind of, you know, um, jiggle them around like they were Mm -hmm. loose change. So who knows? It's not entirely documented, but there's there's a whole thread of of, – there's a whole camp that's like, no, he was super religious. He just kind of hid it. Yeah, he was a bit of a conundrum Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. The more I read about him – it was interesting because he could be uh, quite kind and giving. He could also be very cruel, even to friends of his, as we'll see. 
he was a lot of things. He was a, a, a well-noted liar. <laughs> yeah. So even things that you read that Andy Warhol said oftentimes was not the truth. And the way I took it was he wasn't like, oh, he's a, a liar. He's a bad guy because he lies. Or it, it seemed like he just liked messing with people and he would just make stuff up. Yeah, some people, it's funny because, you know, from the outside, you think of Andy Warhol as almost like an art god. But right. inside the art world, like, there were a lot of people who were just annoyed with him or oh, sure. just thought he was lame or a creep. Um, I saw him com- compared to basically an energy vampire. Yeah. Uh, but then, like you said, other people are like, no, he was very kindly and very giving of himself and uh, of his money and helped people get, like, a start for in their art career that they were looking for. Like, he... Yeah, like you said, it, he he was a, a contradiction in terms in a lot of ways. Yeah, big time. Um, so he obviously is most famous for being a pop artist. Uh, pop art started in London in the early 50s, and Warhol was one of the first U.S. artists to kind of um, get involved in this art movement that emerged from Dada um, and also just had a lot of, uh, it was just sort of in the uh, the early, um, it was in the zeitgeist of the art scene at the time mm-hmm. of this idea of, uh, mass-produced objects being a theme. Um, there was also, at the same time, though, a very different world of people like Jackson Pollock and abstract expressionism happening, mm-hmm. people who were very serious about their art and mm-hmm. who, I imagine, did not appreciate this uh, kid. Well, he wasn't a kid by that point, but this guy named Andy Warhol, this very eccentric guy that's, you know, one of the very first things he did were, were those celebrity screen prints, those silk yeah, screens. Right, yeah. One of the abstract expressionist uh, kings, Willem de Kooning, um, told uh, Andy Warhol to his face that he was a killer of beauty, a killer of art. He said, you even kill laughter. <laughs> you know, de Kooning, <laughs> he killed a lot of laughter too himself. He was pretty drunk at the time, but yeah. I'm sure Andy Warhol didn't like to hear that, right? So, um the uh, so he is associated with pop art, and um, it, it it definitely did dominate abstract expressionism, and it kind of said like, hey, you don't have to just you don't have to take art quite so seriously. And not only that, are you guys paying attention over here to how commercial and consumerist America's becoming? Let's mm-hmm. start meditating on that a little bit. And um, like you said, one of the first ones that really kind of gained attention were um, his um, silk screens of celebrities like Marilyn Monroe. And uh, I think one of the first ones he did was Marilyn's portrait on a gold background. And it was meant to basically kind of look like a Renaissance icon of uh-huh. the Madonna. Just the gold suggested it, I guess, something like yeah. that. And what he was essentially saying, he was equating celebrity as replacing religion now. So it was kind of like comments like that that was the the basis of early right. pop art. Uh, well, should we take a break? Yeah. I don't think this has any great cliffhangers. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. I was trying to find one. All right, so we'll take a break now, and we'll come back with the sort of the beginning of Andy Warhol's pop art career right after this. Right. So we mentioned before the break uh, in 1961, I think one of his first pop art works was called Black and White. Uh, it was Black and White. It was called Coca-Cola 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if the you look deuce. it up, it's, it's, a, it's a drawing of one of those great Coke bottles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this would become a, a thing for him, like brands, especially food and beverages, which is b- very interesting, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he did those silk screens right away. And then the very next year, in 1962 is when those Campbell's soup cans uh, came out. Uh, a couple of the things he's most well-known for were those celebrity silk screens and the Campbell's soup cans, 32 portraits. Uh, and I love that Livia used those in quotes, used portraits in quotes, uh, because what he did was he would project, is what I did when I was a kid. I had a little overhead projector, and I would project an image of Opus the Penguin or Bill the Cat on a wall, uh-huh. and I would trace it, and I would act like I could draw. <laughs> right. When I couldn't, I was just tracing something. And that's what he did with those soup cans. He traced them from being projected on a wall. Yeah. So they were the first 32 portraits were um, hand drawn. His first Campbell soup one um, portraits were. Um, and he actually didn't have the idea himself. He, he paid $50 to a designer named uh, Muriel Latau at a party. He paid by check for the idea. 
she said she had a good idea and that was it. And he turned it into his whole career. And then there's one other development too while he was doing the Campbell soup cans that really kind of um, altered his career. That instead of projecting onto, you know, a canvas and then hand drawing something and then going back and painting it, um, he figured out that you could take, uh, you could project an image onto a silk screen that had emulsion on it that would burn that image onto that silk screen and all of a sudden you had a stencil and you could put whatever color you wanted through it and make the same thing over and over and over again. And so his next series of soup cans were just Campbell's tomato soup, but in all sorts of different colors. And that kicked off the Marilyn, the Elvis, the the um, uh, Jackie, uh, I think, 100 Ways or something like that. Um, like that, that changed his career because not only did it, it cause a sensation, like nobody had made art like that before and it looked really cool. But also, it allowed him to form the assembly line that he eventually became famous for. Yeah, I mean, a lot of his art later on was done by these people that worked for him in the factory. And it was, it was you know, if you've ever been to like a, a T-shirt silkscreen place, and there's people just like silkscreen T-shirts one after the other, mm-hmm. Andy Warhol was doing that kind of thing mm-hmm. and becoming very famous for it. Uh, it's very interesting how it all happened. Um, but there was a gallery in 1962, uh, the Ferris Gallery in Los Angeles, where uh, he had his first solo pop art exhibition of these soup cans. Uh, the gallery co-owner was named Irving Bloom, and he displayed them like they were uh, shelves on a uh, or they were cans on a shelf, mm-hmm. uh, like at a supermarket. Very clever. Uh, Dennis Hopper very famously bought one of those first ones. But apparently, uh, Warhol didn't even go. A lot of people didn't go. wasn't super big at first. A it was lot of people too, right? Yeah, a lot of uh, writers were making fun of it uh, in the press. Uh, one quote was like, uh, "Frankly, the cream of asparagus does nothing for me, but the terrifying intensity of the chicken noodle gives me a real zen feeling." <laughs> uh, so he was being mocked um, until, you know. <laughs> He became Andy Warhol. I mean, I'm sure he was mocked for a lot of his career mm-hmm. by some of those same uh, critics that had their nose turned up at stuff like this. For sure. But it was the beginning of this movement in the United States, and no one had ever seen anything like it. No, because nobody had done anything like it. Like like you said, commercialism had kind of slipped in here or there, but this was nothing but commercialism and a comment on commercialism and our relationship to brands and all that kind of stuff. And that was definitely new. Um, and – from that, the the pop art aesthetic like took off. You can basically plant that at the feet of Andy Warhol in his first Campbell soup can portraits, and then very quickly after that, later on the um, tomato soup portraits with silk screening. And um, today, I think uh, I think what happened was, uh, did you say Blum Irving Blum? I said Bloom, but Bloom. He um, he. It may be Blum. Either way. He decided that um, those those portraits should not be sold off individually. They didn't really make sense on their own. They made sense as a group because it was allegedly all 32 flavors, flavors yeah. of Campbell's <laughs> soup. Um, and that, you know, just having scotch broth by itself is kind of right. cool, but not really. <laughs> you need the whole thing. So yeah. he bought back, including uh, Dennis Hopper's, he bought back all of those um, first 32 portraits. And he paid Andy Warhol $1,000. About ten thousand dollars. One today, right? Yeah, one yeah. hand drawn um, or hand painted soup can is called a small torn soup can pepper pot. In two thousand six, that one sold for eleven point eight million dollars. So Irving Blum got these things for a song because it hadn't taken off yet, but it it did very quickly after. Well, that that, that uh, small torn Campbell soup can. That wasn't even one of the big right. paintings. Yeah. That was paper dresses. We talked about paper dresses were a thing at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, literally dresses made out of these like paper pieces. And he was making these paper dresses with images silk screened on them. And Campbell's Soup even started doing that later on. <laughs> but w- just one of the pictures from one of the dresses sold for almost 12 million bucks. Oh, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. I also saw, too, um, I don't understand art um, unless somebody explains it to me. Same here. But I saw that the, especially the silkscreen tomato soup cans that are the same soup can but in a bunch of different colors, mm-hmm. that what he's doing is by taking this thing that you take as a given that's so familiar. It's a Campbell soup can. I recognize it. Everybody knows what that is. 
And by putting, by playing with the colors and making different color combinations, he was actually like basically melting the brand. The whole idea of the brand, the whole identity of the brand was just kind of being stripped away um, mm-hmm. from the viewer's brain and turned into something else it, without the viewer even really realizing it because the, yeah. the colors were so pretty that it, you just kind of lost track that it, you're looking at a soup can even though you start out knowing that you're looking at a soup can. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting too. Yeah. Uh, as far as pop art goes, you know, you mentioned a comment on consumerism. Uh, you know, it sort of depends on who you ask on what it means. That can be a comment on consumeris- consumerism. Mm-hmm. It could be uh, just, you know, everyday things are um, like celebrating something that's everyday and ordinary. Uh, Andy Warhol himself said pop art is just about liking things and that he ate Campbell's soup every day uh, for lunch for 20 years. Right. I don't know if that's true. That sounds like one of his little stories that he might tell. But for him, it was very simple. I don't think he tried to get to... Um, overly analytical about it. He was just like, it's pop art. And that's the whole point is you shouldn't examine it too closely. Well, one of the other things, though, is that he was very ambitious. He liked money. He liked fame. He wanted to be known as the greatest artist in the world. And he was like, he was a consumer himself. Like he liked stuff. He liked spending money on things like that story about him walking around with loose diamonds in his pocket. So it, it's a it's weird. He was in, he liked the very stuff that his paintings allegedly criticized or made fun of or mocked or analyzed. He was into that same scene. He mm-hmm. wasn't an outsider to it. He was as much a, a, an American consumer as anybody else. And that was um that was very odd for that time. You know, that was the time where like you didn't want to be a sellout or anything like that. Andy Warhol was a sellout from the very beginning. He even yeah. put a, a fake ad in the Village Voice saying, like, he would attach his name to the following things if you would pay right. him for it. <laughs> um, and it was a joke, but all, at the same time, it wasn't a joke, as we'll see. He started making what he called business art and started making a lot of money from it. Um, and as a result of his taking that up very quickly, becoming, like, basically a sellout as as soon as he could— um, the the art critics basically say his period of actual good artwork just lasted from 1961 with the Coca-Cola bottles mm-hmm. to the 1964 Flowers edition. So three years. Interesting. Even though his career kept going on, that that was his last notable painting. Specifically, there's an art critic for the Washington Post named Blake Gopnik who wrote a 900-page biography on uh, Andy Warhol and his art. And he... I don't think it was just his opinion. I think that's generally the art critic world's opinion that he he was almost a flash in the pan as far as actually producing good art is concerned. Well, yeah, I mean, what because what he was was a he he kind of was the art. Uh, he he created a a brand and a persona mm-hmm. uh, that was bigger than the art itself. So it was. I mean, you talk about separating art from artists. It's it was indistinguishable in Andy Warhol's case. It was all a part of who he was, this, which was this, he was the Campbell soup can, you know? Yeah, and I mean, it, we take it for granted today, living decades into the postmodern era and now decades into the era of influencers and Instagram. Like, that's a normal thought to us. Right, totally. This guy was doing this when modernism still reigned and postmodernism was just starting to bleed out of it, where yeah. there weren't such things as influencers. Like, he... he I don't want to, maybe he did. He might have invented it. At the very least, he gave other people, mm-hmm. a lot of other people, the idea to to try the same things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have to talk about his filmmaking because he would branch out away from, uh, you know, screen printing things, although he, he did that kind of uh, throughout, I think, because he had his, his factory going. Uh, but in the mid-60s, he started to make uh, visual art. Uh, in 63, his first film, Sleep, I was about to say came out, but it kind of didn't really. I'm sure it played in some avant-garde theaters here and there. Uh, but his movies were, <laughs> they were, they weren't movies. They didn't have plots and characters and three-act structure and stuff like that. He would sit a camera up in front of the Empire State Building and shoot it for eight hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sleep was five hours and 21 minutes of his boyfriend, uh, John Giorno, sleeping. Um, he his most successful movie, if you want to call it that, was called The Chelsea Girls mm-hmm. in '66. 
Uh, I love Livia says it came at, at a relatively snappy three hours. Well, what's funny is it came in at three hours because it was a six-hour movie that he split in half and projected right. side by side <laughs> next to each other. So technically, it was six hours. It was six hours. Uh, but this also didn't have a plot. Um, he was very explicit with his uh, real sex in movies uh, without it being – well, I'm sure a lot of people labeled it pornography at the time, but uh, it was art. Um, also and, drug use, too. Oh, sure. Like it was, he was very open and, and explicit about all of this at, uh, like I mentioned, the factory. He had three uh, places called the factory, mm -hmm. and they were his art studios. They were his meeting places, his party spaces, uh, the first one being at East 47th in 1964. Yeah, that was the silver factory. Um, an artist named Billy Name. And name is not his real last name. He just adopted it. It's kind of like sure. generic. I, I love that. Yeah. Um, he covered it in aluminum foil and silver paint, which gave it the name Silver Factory, but it was also a former fat hat, hat factory. A fat factory is another way to put it. <laughs> and the other reason factory applies is because, um, remember, Andy Warhol was the one who came up with assembly line art. Yeah. He would have an idea, or maybe somebody would give him an idea. He would execute it initially, like maybe create the first stencil, make a, a couple versions of it with different color combinations, and then after that... He would basically leave it to his assistants to start producing his art that he would sign. It was his art, but that was a brand new way of considering art. And so much so that he, um, he had a, a, an assistant, a guy who basically became his right hand. Um, his name was Gerard Malanga, or Malanga, as we'll see. Um, he uh, would go to interviews with Andy Warhol, and Warhol would be like, why don't you ask my assistant Jerry here some questions? He did a lot of my paintings. And I think most people at the time just thought he was kidding. And he wasn't kidding at all. Like, not just Jerry, but other people were physically making the paintings that he was selling for tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, and to be clear, I know people are typing up emails right now. This is not a new idea, and this is not something that doesn't happen all the time in the art world. There are, uh, in fact, we got an email from someone recently who was called a ghost artist, like a ghost writer. Mm -hmm. They, very famous artists, uh, many, many times have assistants that actually pump out these paintings in their style mm -hmm. and sell them. Wow. It's always happened. I had a friend who 25 years ago did it for a guy here in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and now she's her own artist and has her own gallery, which is great. Oh, great. But that's how an assistant a lot of times can get their foot in the door is by uh, – working for a very famous artist who has other people paint their art. It's okay. just, it happens so, all the time. All right, then, if he didn't invent it, he was the one who made no secret of it whatsoever. He exposed it and actually used it to his benefit. Well, and his uh, had definitely more of a assembly line feel than the others. Uh, it's not like uh, other ghost artists like, I'll paint the trees, and then you slide it to the next person who paints the mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, a single artist sort of recreating the pieces of art or, or a team of six assistants that are all working on their individual thing. Right. It's not like a, a factory kind of thing that Andy Warhol did. So it was a little different. So initially his um, assistants were uh, basically um, – this, this is going to sound unkind. They were um, very heavy drug users, if not addicted to drugs – yeah. Um, they were very frequently street kids. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them had been kicked out of their houses because they were transgender or they were gay. Um, they were they were society's cast off and, and yeah. weirdos. And he collected them like they were um, precious memory figurines and surrounded himself with them. Yeah. And that included, uh, well, he collected all kinds of people. He collected them. The factory was a scene, man. It was like... You could have uh, some, you know, 17-year-old street kid who was a junkie sitting next to uh, a very famous, you know, actor, like a, a Dennis Hopper or a real musician. Um, and, of course, the Velvet Underground was never that big in the United States. That's kind of what they're famous for these days is, is America not ever really accepting them. They were huge in Europe. Uh -huh. But the Velvet Underground was uh, had a thing going in New York. Andy Warhol was their first manager. He financed that first great record and brought in Nico uh, to sing on it. He, he designed that great album cover with a banana. Uh, and he was that was part of the scene. The Velvet Underground was hanging out there at the factory. Uh, Dennis Hopper's hanging out at the factory. People are coming and going. They're doing heroin. 
They're having sex out in front of everyone. Shooting a it lot was, of speed, too. That was a big one. Lots of speed. It was it was wild. It was super wild. Like, they people would just walk around naked. Like, it was n- nuts. Totally unhinged. Like, there were very few rules or regulations or anything like that. I think it was just one of those things where if you got in and you could manage to stay in, you could do basically whatever you wanted. And I also yeah. get the idea that people performed like it was performative too um that it was also very um uh competitive because yes one of the things that he was known to do was to just really latch on to somebody and find them very interesting and mm-hmm. then he would get bored with them and just kind of leave them behind in the dust yeah and i think that was one of the reasons why he was called i think it was fran lewitz who said that who called him a vampire mm-hmm. he would not just kind of take energy from people he would also um take talent from people. Apparently, he had a talent for recognizing the peculiar talents to, that each individual person has and then using them for himself. Yeah. So, for example, I think one of his um, his assistants named um, uh, Bob Colicello, Andy Warhol had a terrible memory, but he liked to record everything with his tape recorder so he could remember. Not everybody wanted him to use his tape recorder. And Bob Colicello, he found out, had a really great memory. So Bob Colicello was his human tape recorder when somebody wouldn't let him record their conversation. Just stuff yeah. like that. Just random stuff like that. And he, he assembled his life the way he wanted it, using the people he surrounded himself with, and then just kind of interchanging them like they were Tetris parts when he, he saw fit. Yeah. There was a, an author and a performer named Bridget Berlin who was around in the uh, 60s and 70s at the factory, hopped up on speed. She would do all kinds of work. She sometimes would um, run the factory line. Sometimes she would uh, get a hold of his diaries and edit his diaries. Sometimes she would co-write his books. Uh, Edie Sedgwick, uh, very probably one of the biggest of his, what he called the superstars, as far as you know, name recognition. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was a, a very pretty young woman, very troubled. Uh, she was from a very prominent family. Uh, they met in 1965 when she was 21 and he was 36. Uh, she went out on to be in 10 of those movies of his, and they were inseparable at a certain point. They would match outfits. Uh, she was always on his arm. But when you talk to insiders, they would say that, you know, he treated Edie very badly uh, at times. And at one point he said, do you think Edie will let us film her when she commits suicide? Uh, so it was that kind of thing that happened. Um, she very sadly died of a of a drug overdose when she was 28 years old. So yeah. just seven years into their relationship. Yeah, I've also seen it pointed out that um, there was a habit of people um, around him dying young. And that's not the case with everybody. Like Bridget Berlin was shown shooting up speed in Chelsea Girls. And I think she lived to 2020. Um, so people could make it out of his orbit um, alive. But other people like Edie Sedgwick didn't. And some people blame Andy Warhol for um, encouraging just that kind of behavior, people's self-destructive behavior, either for his own amusement or whatever he was getting out of it. I think that cult song, Edie, was about Edie Sedgwick. If oh, I'm not was mistaken. it? Yeah, she was yeah. supposedly the first it girl where whatever she did started a nationwide trend among people mm-hmm. who were into fashion or style or whatever. Like she couldn't. Whatever she did, it was just that she had her own thing and everybody put her up on this pedestal. And she was a, a bright, brilliant star. Yeah. Uh, Candy Darling was another one of his uh, cohorts for a while. Um, and if you look up Candy Darling, like I didn't even know a ton about Warhol, a little bit here and there. But when I looked up Candy Darling, I was like, oh, I, I've, I've seen this person mm-hmm. in pictures mm-hmm. like my whole life. I feel like um, Candy Darling was a transgender woman. Uh, got hormone therapy at a time when that wasn't something that people did or was even very easy to get done. And uh, also Jackie Curtis was uh, friends with Candy Darling, and they were kind of a pair with Warhol. And Jackie Curtis was a playwright and a poet and a singer and was back in the 1960s playing with gender identity and using different pronouns and uh, using terms like, you know, fluidity and things like that. Uh, this is at a time where, like, no one was doing this kind of thing, and that's what Jackie Curtis is doing. Yes. Another very famous superstar, I don't know if we said or not, he would call them superstars, the people who are around him and starred in his movies and stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Well done, Chuck. Another <laughs> superstar is a guy named Robert Olivio, who was um, known as Undine. Is that how you'd uh-huh. say it? I don't know if it was Undine or Undine, but 
on Dean sounds more right. I think so, too. Um, he met Andy Warhol um, at a really chic party. No, I'm sorry. He met Andy Warhol at uh, an orgy in the early 60s, and Undine <laughs> did not like Andy Warhol from the get-go because um, Andy Warhol was just standing there watching everybody, not participating, basically, and Undine didn't like that at all. So he had his friend whose orgy it was throw Andy Warhol out, and they crossed paths again later and, and I guess, hugged it out, and Undine became one of his, his uh, favorite people. Yeah, I mean, there's a if you look up Andy Warhol superstars, there's a very very long list of people. Uh, we obviously can't go over all of them, uh, but we should mention um, Joe D'Alessandro. He was the one of the more one of the more famous, at least in that scene. Uh, was the one of the actors in many of his films, and uh, just a sort of a gay subculture sex symbol icon uh, for you know a couple of decades, and I think is. Still around. He was also he was also the model for the Rolling Stones Sticky Fingers cover. Oh, is that D'Alessandro? Yeah, that f- okay. cover of just basically a man's crotch. In that was jeans. his crotch. <laughs> Fair, pretty tight jeans too. They're very tight. Uh, do you want to take a break and then come back and talk about um, who shot Andy Warhol? Yeah, it was Lily Taylor. Right after this. So nice reference, Chuck, to I Shot Andy Warhol, the movie, um, which I think contains the Yola Tango song, I Shot Andy Warhol, right? Isn't that for that movie? Probably. I don't remember. It's been a while. That's a great song. It's got to be. Yeah. Let's go listen to that song. It's very good. Um, So Valerie Solanus is who Lily Taylor was playing in that movie, I Shot Andy Warhol. Um, And she was, again, if you have our book, go read chapter 18. It goes way. Not the kid's book. No, it wasn't in the kid's book. (laughs) No. Um, it goes way into detail about Valerie Solanus and the shooting. But in, in um, the abbreviated version, is she was a radical feminist, a playwright, um, a man hater. And I say that quite confidently because she was the founder and sole member of the Society for Cutting Up Men, SCUM, uh-huh. author of the SCUM Manifesto, which is definitely worth reading. I think I've mentioned before on the yeah. show. Um and she had a beef with Warhol. She wrote a play called um, Up Your Ass, and she wanted Warhol to produce it. And not only would he <laughs> not produce it, he lost the manuscript that she gave him, or the script that she gave him. And that really enraged her. And apparently the Andy Warhol Foundation um, and Museum in Pittsburgh <coughs> has that script still. They keep it under lock and key. But yeah. um uh, she never got it back, essentially. And then he also used some of her um, recorded words without credit in, in um, one of his movies. So she did not like Andy Warhol. She was kind of fixated on him. And on June 3rd, 1968, she shot him. Up your ass is so funny. Oh, and there's like so many it's like so sub- subtitles to it, too. But you yeah. can just call it up your ass. I haven't seen that in a long, long time. I saw that movie back when it came out. Uh, and Lily Taylor was so good. I just, I love her, and she's amazing in that role. But, yeah, on June 3rd, 1968, she went to uh, the apartment of um, another sort of art scene lady named Margot uh, Fiden and said, uh, was, you know, really pretty out of it. She suffered from schizophrenia, so she was not having a good day. Um, She was still trying to get this play made and was uh, almost begging her, her, this woman, Margot, uh, to do that. And she said, you know, that she couldn't do that. And she said, oh, yes, you will, because I'm going to shoot Andy Warhol, showed off her gun uh, and left. And apparently, um, Fiden tried to warn Warhol, wasn't able to get to him. Uh, This is when the factory was now at Union Square. Mm -hmm. And she shot him and um, did not immediately kill him. We'll hold on to that till the end. But uh, he was really messed up. He got a lot of uh, had a lot of damage to his internal organs, had many surgeries, Uh, a lot of scarring and had to wear a corset for the rest of his life because of these injuries. A medical corset that held his guts in, essentially. Yeah. Um, I saw that he, when he was recuperating in the hospital, he said to somebody, you know, we got to get some bigger things to hide behind. (laughs) Isn't that great? 
very Andy Warhol. <laughs> so he did survive, um, it, but he was different after that. And some people yeah. argue that he was already headed in this direction. But basically, he stopped hanging out with um, the people living on the fringes of society, entered society, uh, like high society. Um, he took his rightful place there as like a, a beloved art god among people who could pay millions of dollars for paintings. Yeah. Um, Got a really nice house, got a Rolls Royce. And then the the next um, factory that he set up was like a legit business. And he started making yeah. what he called business art, where if you were very uh, wealthy, you could have him paint you in the style of Marilyn or Elvis, that kind of yeah. silkscreen thing. And yeah. he would take your money and be totally fine with it. And he became, again, such a sellout. There's really no other way to put it that even those portraits started to become bad. Like, he didn't even pay that much attention to them, even though that's what he was doing. And he got such a bad name toward the end of his career that when he was hanging out with Basquiat, um, Basquiat's career was kind of dragged down for a little yeah. period of time because he was very close to Andy Warhol. That's how bad a reputation Andy Warhol got. He became a parody of himself to people in the art world toward the end of his life. Yeah, it's a much different scene uh, than I mean. He kind of, in a way, got nineteen eighties. You know, yeah, I guess it, so. it, it, he sort of mirrored what happened in the nineteen eighties mm -hmm. with consumerism and just you know MTV came along. He did a couple of shows on MTV, very cool uh, shows too. One called Andy Warhol's TV and one called Andy Warhol's Fifteen Minutes. Yeah, they were they weren't bad actually, um, but it was a different thing for sure. Uh, he, like you said, he sold out from the beginning, but I think everyone in his circle, like, thought he really sold out in the 80s, like, and not in a good way that he should be proud of, you know? I think it just took the rest of the world, uh, like, that long to catch on that he he had always been a sellout and was totally fine with that and didn't care. Maybe, yeah. That's So this is his reputation in the art world. His star was still quite bright everywhere else. Like, he would be on TV. Um, he, Like you said, he had two different MTV shows in the mid-'80s. Like, he was hanging out with some of the great up-and-coming artists like Basquiat or Keith Haring. Um, he was just – he was very well-known. He got work as much as he needed. Um, and his last major work was pretty great. It was a, um, a an interpretation of The Last Supper. Um, uh -huh. Part of it is like a, a sales sticker that says six ninety nine. It's one of the more prominent things. And then another prominent thing, there's Jesus is on there too. And next to it, it says the big C. <laughs> <laughs> what does that even stand for? I think Christ. Christ, yeah, I guess. The big C. Uh, it could be anything though, if you think about it. It could be, but this is the Last Supper. So he was, again, not really revered in the art world until after his death. And it became very clear that like this guy was a an artistic genius, not just in his art, but in his life, too. Like like the Time Capsules is a good example of that. Yeah, he, in 74, he started the Time Capsules project. Uh, he filled up uh, 569 cardboard boxes, uh, a steamer trunk, 20 filing cabinets, and they're, you know, letters. They're uh, bric-a-brac from his life. There's artwork, there's ticket stubs, there's clothing. Uh, all the way back uh, from the 1950s, uh, for about uh, close to 30 years worth of stuff in these time capsules. Yeah, I so saw he would just sweep his desk clean into a box like once every <laughs> week or two and like write TC on it for time capsule. Well, when you're that famous, that becomes hugely valuable. If I swept the stuff off of my desk, it's not worth anything. <laughs> so, so, right. so you've got the, uh, the time capsules, which is a really deep peek into his life. Um, he also kept diaries, and Yumi brought this to my attention. She she um, was super into Andy Warhol for a while, and she found out that he had been audited, Chuck, every year yeah. um, from, by the IRS from 1972 until his death in um, 1987. Yeah, thank you, Nixon. Yeah, he attributed it to Nixon, revenge from Nixon, and that's actually probably a pretty good hypothesis. Um, because he had created um, political artwork for George McGovern's 1972 campaign. And it was like an ugly portrait of Nixon. Then underneath yeah. it said, vote McGovern. <laughs> and it's entirely possible Nixon ordered him to be audited. And it just oh, got kept up. That's no, it's no coincidence you don't get audited every year. Sure. 
So, That's not how it works. So he would start noting everything, right? Oh, I'm sure that he kept very good records from that point on. He did. He would dictate his diary by phone every morning, and um, those became published later on as Andy Warhol's diaries. Um, so there's a lot known about that guy, and yet he's still an enigma. Yeah, very much. Um, when I said earlier that he did not die, at least right away, uh, from that gunshot— uh, he would die from complications from that gunshot many years later. Mm -hmm. uh, in February of 1987, he was 58 years old, uh, complications of uh, having his gallbladder removed. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, they can draw a direct line to that shooting and his eventual death. Uh, he left a treasure trove, like you said, of stuff. He donated everything, basically, uh, to what is now the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts uh, they, it's worth a lot of money. They've given out close to 300 million bucks, uh, just in grants to more than a thousand art organizations over the year. No. And, uh, I think they are partnered with the Carnegie Institute and the, uh, Dia Art Foundation, uh, to build the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, which is where I last year saw Bonnie Prince Billy. Oh yeah. Play, play one of my many shows that I've seen of his. Right. He played at the Andy Warhol Museum because oh, cool. that's uh, what he does. He plays at weird places like that. Or not weird, just different places. Uh, and it was great. And it was cool to walk around that museum oh, a little bit beforehand. They have more than uh, – they have a lot of his work. Uh, they have more than 4,000 videotapes. And they got those time capsules there. Yeah, every single one of them, I think, right? I think so. Um, so in addition to predicting the 15 minutes of fame for the future, even if he didn't originally come up with it, he also had another idea that I think kind of came to fruition later on. Um, he had an idea for a chain of diners that he called Andy Mats, and they were for people who eat alone. And you just sit at a table, uh -huh. they, they serve you frozen food, and then you watch TV by yourself, and that everyone has their own TV set. Oh, interesting. He basically just predicted smartphones in society right. <laughs> today. <laughs> That's where we are now. Yeah, for Never sure. Never thought of that. And then there's one other thing. If you are a fan of cringe, you don't like cringe, do you? Uh, like cringe comedy? Yeah, or, yeah, basically, or cringe performance art. Uh, I like stuff like The Office, um, okay. but it, it can border on, like, I don't want to watch this, for sure. Yeah, I, 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 I can't take it very easily. And um, mm -hmm. he, if you watch his interviews— they're very cringy. He would purposefully <laughs> just sit there and go, er, um, yeah, or whatever. Like that stuff, actually. And he wouldn't, he like, he didn't have anything to say or couldn't think of what to say. Like, he would just be a terrible interviewee. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And then there's also a, a Mike Douglas, no, Merv Griffin uh, show segment with him and Edie Sedgwick. And mm -hmm. he just refuses to talk the whole time. And yeah. it's up to Edie Sedgwick to try to keep things going. And she's like 21 years old. Uh, it's just really hard to watch. I think I made it maybe a minute uh -huh. into it, and I was like, I can't watch this anymore. I can actually watch that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to check that out. Okay. You're going to love it. I don't it. know how much I love it, but oh. uh, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes when someone is just – I think that it's having no regard for – and I'm not saying it's like it's cool to go in there and like wreck an interview, for but sure. like I also think like – I don't know if someone doesn't believe in that system and they think it's all BS to make a statement like that is like, fine, as long as everyone's not doing it. No one wants to watch everybody do that. Yeah, for sure. It's weird, though, because he was in, enthralled by celebrity from a very yeah. young age, but he wouldn't right. participate in it when he was a celebrity himself, even but though he, also loved he wanted to be a celebrity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A conundrum. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that's it for Andy Warhol, huh? Yeah, this this could have been uh, two or three eps, but um, I think it's a pretty good overview. I think so, too. Um, if you want to know more about Andy Warhol, there, like you said, is a lot more to learn. Uh, and you can find stuff starting out on the Internet and then go to Pittsburgh and see his stuff in person. And then save up $11 million and buy one of his paintings yourself. That's right. And while you're saving that money up, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this short and shortish in Swedish. Hey, guys. Uh, actually, this is more than Swedish. This is great. Uh, hey, guys. I'm an old, retired concert pianist who remembers many Hammond organs from my youth. I didn't play them professionally. But listen to this, Josh. You're going to love this. I was the pianist for the Pittsburgh Symphony. And I was so interested, though, in the history of the Hammond. I had no idea 
uh, had actually never even thought about their origin, although I played a few in funeral homes over the years. Mm -hmm. I played big pipe organs with stops, including uh, for the Pittsburgh Symphony, but I never mastered those slide bars on the Hammond. Uh, It's interesting you did a whole podcast about Hammond organs, but I don't think we heard a single musical note. Uh, There was a wonderful young lady, Rhoda Scott, who used uh, to play at the Hurricane Lounge in Pittsburgh. She's still living, also in her early 80s, like me. Thanks for a wonderful learning experience. And this, my friends, is from uh, a legend, uh, Patricia Prattis Jennings. And I did a little uh, Mm wormholing with Patricia. And it turns out Patricia is a legend. She played, uh, I believe she was the uh, first black woman to sign a major contract the major symphony in the United States. Nice. Uh, there's a great, great YouTube piece on her. Uh, I can't remember. It's a, a Pittsburgh, a local Pittsburgh thing, but it, it's really good. And there, she's interviewed, and she's just wonderful and amazing talent. And it just knocks me out that uh, in her 80s, she's like getting something out of our show. That is pretty cool, and that's a lot of range too, going from the symphony to a funeral. That's pretty cool. Yeah, totally. But she played for the symphony, Pittsburgh Symphony, for decades. Right. But she could also play a funeral, too. I'm sure they're quite different. The whole Absolutely. vibe's got to be different, you know? I would think so. And also, one more thing. I'll bet the Hurricane Lounge was the place to be. It sounds like it, doesn't it? Thanks a lot, Patricia. That was really cool. Um, thank you for writing in. And like Chuck said, thank you for getting something out of our episode. And if you want to be like Patricia, you can get in touch with us via email, too. Send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.